This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Our goal at Everyday Tech is to keep your technology not only working, but working for you. I'm the host, Abram Nanny, and you can join me and my friends Wednesday mornings at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Or search Everyday Tech on your favorite podcasting app or download the MPB Public Media app. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts. It's the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Well, summer is slowly coming to an end, so we can start preparing for the fall migrations of some of the birds of America. And whether they call Mississippi home or are just passing through, the birds throughout the area this time of year are a wonder to observe. Joining us today to discuss his own backyard observations is our good friend of the show and frequent contributor, biologist Joe McGee. You can send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. Always like to remind you, if you miss Creature Comforts on Thursday, it repeats Saturday mornings at 6. So good morning, Libby. I think we will start with you still reporting to us from the West Coast. How are things out in Oregon? Oh, everything's still going great. Beautiful weather. We've got, uh, I say beautiful weather, I guess that depends on from whose perspective. (laughs) It's uh, raining this morning, just a little light sprinkle. And, um, oh, probably 58 degrees from what I can see from here. So um, it's cool. And of course, what Paul Hartfield woke up this morning thinking it's a great day to go crabbing and fishing. So he's <laughs> <laughs> he's loading up the crab traps and going off just to fish. Uh, our wildlife managers out here in Oregon are hard at work deciding what to do with those fish populations. And uh, the coho salmon, the, with the coho salmon, they have to be very careful. You know, we all enjoy salmon all over the country, but we can't catch it close to the Gulf. So uh, uh, the cam- salmon has to come from the West Coast or the East Coast. So out here, they set um, monthly coho salmon limits for kind of everybody, a collective limit, and they are very careful about keeping records from who catches what. So the coho salmon have been closed off of Newport for the month. So uh, he can catch a Chinook or carefully throw back any coho that he accidentally catches. But um, he'll, I think he'll probably mostly be going for his uh, Dungeness crabs today anyway. But I decided to stay home, so I've got the eight-year-old with me, and uh, we'll probably enjoy some walks today. And um, speaking with Joe during this week remotely, I uh, came up with some birds that I miss from Mississippi, and uh, because we were talking about his topic for today, and uh, I've got those three birds. You might want to come back to me later about that, or um, I can talk about it now, whichever you would prefer. Well, we got you going, so why don't you give us what you got? Okay. The the birds that I saw, now we both are, Joe and I both live on our piece of properties for a long time. He's longer than me even. I think he grew up there too, but um, I've been 45 years on the piece of land that I live on in Hines County, and three birds that I enjoyed when we first moved there, but very much took for granted, I guess, uh, were northern bobwhite quail, which we heard year-round, of course, and uh, enjoyed immensely. And I had always lived in places where there were northern bobwhite quail, and so very much took them for granted anyway. They were just a, a part of life particularly in the evenings. And um, painted bunting was a, a, a migrant that nested on our property and we could dependably see, you know, that was kind of one of the hallmarks of spring for us were our painted buntings. And then the third bird were eastern meadowlarks, which I also love a lot. And they were a year-round resident and enjoyed so much seeing and hearing them. Through the years, have um, 
the land use around us has changed and uh, I guess the city has grown a little out towards us and uh, for a variety of reasons, some complicated and some easy to figure out. I guess these three birds have disappeared not just from our land, but are much rarer all around the southeastern United States. And it all has to do with what's growing, you know, what plants, how the, how the soil is being used. And uh, we all, I guess, take for granted that something is going to stay the way it is when um, when we think about it at all, um, objectively, we realize, no, that things are constantly in flux. So uh, the right the right elements always have to be together. The weather, the plant cover of the land, which depends on the soil, and um, also how that soil is used by the human population has to do with what animals and plants we're going to see. Libby, this is Joe. Could I could I comment on something? Sure. Please do. Uh, <laughs> Painted bunnings have never been common over in East, in, where I live, over in East Mississippi. I had oh, really? One, okay. Uh, uh, even, Mr. Turcotte even talked to me about that once. Uh -huh. But one time, one did show up in my yard at a fe and ca eventually came to a feeder and was feeding with indigo buntings and uh, the other, you know, goldfinches and that sort of thing in the spring. But you mentioned the meadowlarks. Their numbers seem to, now those were common. I can remember walking in a cow pasture when I was growing up and finding the, the uh, meadowlark nests. On the, they nest on the ground. In, have you ever seen the nest, Libby, of a, of a meadowlark? Yes, it's yes. real pretty. It has a little dome, over, a half dome over the mm -hmm. nest itself. Real pretty. And when you, uh, they don't fly until you almost, you almost step on the nest and then the bird takes off. And then if you step back and watch, then when they fly back in to get back on the eggs and then keep the eggs warm, they don't land right on the nest. They land, I don't know, some distance away and then walk to the nest to get back on it. But I think, you know, there were cows out there. I think they almost benefited from the cows. I, I'm not sure what the relationship there was, but now that area is just a hay field. It may not be large enough because some pine plantations have been planted around. But but the, I see metal arcs to my wish, but they're way down, I think, their numbers. Uh, but I did have experiences with them. And the Bob Whites, none I haven't seen or heard any this year. But, but a couple of years ago, I heard one. And it was on like an afternoon. And I sat out on the driveway and actually called that bird in. And I have I'm, the the bird almost flew into my lap. <laughs> I have videos of this. Did I ever, Libby, did I ever send that, send you a copy of that video? No, but now you'll have to. <laughs> yes, that sounds I'll wonderful. To, yeah, I'll have to figure out how to do that. It, it's wild. I mean, and then the, you can see the Bob White feeding with other birds out on my driveway where I'd put some seed. I, I may have to get somebody like Abram to help me figure out how to, because, you know, video, when you make a video, you don't know when to stop and it's too big to, you know, send around. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But I, I do want to. I, I want to get that to you. I'd love for you to see that. So I have a question. I like to to, to uh, talk about the descriptors that they attach to birds and kind of what they mean and that sort of thing. So a painted does that mean that the coloration looks as it were painted on them? Yes, painted yes. bunnings are unbelievably beautiful. Uh, let me see if I can get this right. The head, Libby, is the head blue. The back is sort of a chartreuse color, and the breast. And it all is red, or am I getting the, the breast has red? Yeah, yeah, there's red, blue, green, a beautiful shade of green that is a yeah. little bit turquoisey, I guess. Yeah. yeah, and then you get the appearance of some yellow. I guess I should pull up the bird book and uh, look at all the colors, but it's just kind of amazing what all gets put on that little bird. Yeah, and a lot of times the red is what catches your eye at first. Yeah. The first the first one I ever saw in my life we were really little I'll never forget this when we lived over in our old house and we had a set of bed springs out on the front porch we were cleaning them we were doing like really rigorous house cleaning and it was about this time of year and the light was on on the front porch and one flew into the front porch we didn't know what it was we thought this bird has escaped from a circus or a fair or something. This is has been dyed, as Kevin suggested. Somebody has painted this bird. But then we, you know, we didn't have field guides and all in those days. But we learned later that uh, no, that's the way they are. Uh, and it is a, in some areas they come to feeders routinely, like in, I think in Florida, 
uh, coastal areas, they will come to feeders. Yeah, and they always came to our feeder, yeah. Oh, and the where you're living? The first years that I put feeders out, they, they were there, yeah. Where you're living now? Yeah, yeah. well, yes. Uh, the first, in Hines County. The yeah. first bird, uh, painted bunny I ever saw as, a, you know, as an official bird, you know, put it on my list, so to speak, was <laughs> over your way. It was near Bovina. And th- that's where um, Mr. Turcott, down, just down the road from us, Brownsville area, is where he recorded them for the first time. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. he showed us where they nested, and we had them in our nest. Fence row, you know, I, I've always just, I, I don't know, you know, I hate to be the old timer here on the radio, but back in the day, uh, there was no easy way to get weeds off of a fence. There were no weed eaters and there were no, um, not the kinds of poisons that you have today. So everybody's fence row was grown up. Yeah. And yeah. we had we had a lot of um, blackberry, all kinds of things growing in there. And, you know, that was just common for there be a line of vegetation between fields. And all three of these birds, I felt like, were always close to those, if not in them. The meadowlark was on the ground, but they were close, and the bobwhite was on the ground. But they would, I guess they could use those for shelter or um, hiding when they needed to. But the painted buntings always nested that that I saw. I found three nests during the time that that, uh, they were there. And they were always in a fence row. Yeah, the first. So there would be barbed wire fence, and then there'd be right. vegetation growing on it, and they would be there, maybe two or three feet off the ground. The first painted bunnings I saw over there at Bovina were in an incredible tangle of like honeysuckle and you know, which is not even native, but smilax, mm-hmm. all kind of viney material, and blackberries, as you suggest. Uh, yeah, that's what they like. The uh, Bob Whites like that kind of stuff for shelter, but and they will only venture so far out into an open field instinctively they know if they get too far and get caught by and a hawk flies over it it would you know, it'd be curtains for them they'll only go so far out in an open field and the, and the fields are really too far for them nowadays you know modern f- farm practices are not not good for bob whites as i mentioned dr majors joins us from his clinic in jackson as he does each thursday dr major got a couple of dog questions for you but first okay. we sometimes neglect you um, we know that you're a big bird watcher enjoy seeing nature that's around uh, you and your house and your clinic what what sorts of birds have you been seeing lately you know hummingbirds have been really really active uh, i guess they're moving through uh see a lot of them at, you know anywhere from five to ten around the feeders uh, incidentally, just a couple of notes. I guess we'd call them yard deer. Uh, the, uh, we just had a pair of twins, which is usual, uh, born uh, this week, and they've been interesting to watch them. They kind of hang around the edge of the woods. Uh, but it's there. They seem to be quite active and quite okay. And of course, the meadowlark and bobwhite quail bring back a lot of memories as a, as a child on the farm. And one of the might I want to pull up a song from the metal arc. It's it's really great. Usually it would be in late in the afternoon, uh, especially after a rain. And uh, I just wonder, if Joe can uh, add to this, but I feel like the habitat, of course, like I said, there's not as many pastures maybe as it was. But I think the fire ant situation also is uh, decimated in some areas. A lot of the nesting yes. birds. Uh, Yes, I, I agree with that for sure. Uh, yeah, you, I do think it's bound to have made a difference. I don't have a, a you know a ream of data to to prove that, but you, I don't think you need data to to prove that because uh, they get all mean. <laughs> One thing I mentioned too, uh, uh, everybody. Of course, it's been pretty dry. We had a thunderstorm what last week, but. Uh, be sure uh, to provide some water for birds and other wildlife because it's been pretty dry and uh, it's important, I think, to be able to offer them. Yeah, and unlike uh, unlike you, Dr. Major, we did, you know, when the front came through, we didn't, at my location, we didn't get a drop of rain. Oh, I have not had any rain <laughs> since I was on Creature Conference back in July, <laughs> July 24th or whenever it was. It's been over a month. Mm. And... Uh, we really need some rain, but Libby, it's cool here now. Or this morning it was 63 at my house. Yeah, it's it's, it's not quite so bad. 
I, I always sit when I check our weather, when I walk outside on the porch, but then I always like to pull up Jackson to see what's going on. And I noticed that you need rain, though, don't you? You need rain. But it was a killer here on Sunday in Mississippi, uh, 102 at my house, 103, something like oh. that, with a heat index, you know, way over that. Yeah, you know, it's so getting sorry. crazy when it gets to the low 90s and you're like, hey, this is great. We, <laughs> we're <Yeah>. loving this. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, Dr. Major, two uh, questions uh, from the same person yes. about a uh, dog. Uh, the first one is, it's an older pet dog who has a cataract developing on her left eye. I can tell by her head movement that she's getting to where she can't really see out of it. Is there a remedy uh, or uh, to prevent her from going blind? And if so, will she adjust and be able to see out of just the one eye? Certainly they can see out of the one eye, of course. One of the things about cataracts, uh, a lot of times if it develops in one eye, will also develop in the other eye. How old is this dog, did they say? It says in her 50s and close to 60s, so I'm assuming that, that they're trying to convert that into human years because I can't believe it's been a 50-year dog, but an older dog I'm for sure, I would guess. Right. Usually after about 10, 11 years, they start to develop cataracts. And it may not, a lot of times the cataracts do not impair vision that much. Uh, and if it's an inside dog, uh, certainly it can find its way around the house pretty well. Usually causes more problems uh, at dusk and dawn when there's uh, very little light. Uh, but yes, uh, it may mature to where the dog cannot see out of their eye. We see that uh, fairly frequently. Uh, there, as far as any remedies or home remedies that can be used, I know of none that are effective. Uh, there are uh, veterinarians, uh, specialists that do cataract surgery. And certainly you can talk to your veterinarian about a referral uh, about uh, surgery if you chose to do so. All right. And the second one is an interesting question. It says, I use uh, some hydration and electrolytes packs from time to time and will pour one in the dog's bowl of water uh, because they're out in the heat. And they're wondering if having uh, the little hydration that you can get uh, added to the water that the dog drinks, if that's okay. Certainly it's okay, and uh, I uh, recommend one of them, have several field trial people that uh, have their dogs out. And they run quite a bit uh, and need to stay hydrated, and they really need to be careful with your dogs if they're out in this uh, heat. Um, but, yes, the hydration packs are certainly fine to add to the water. Got some phone calls to get to. We'll start in Horn Lake. Our friend David has called in today. Good morning, David. You're on the air with us, so go ahead. Uh, thank you for taking my call. I'm, I'm enjoying your show. I'm sitting here drinking a cup of coffee watching the hummingbirds. i got a question about fireworks and the decibel levels of our commercial-grade uh, fireworks that are available to the public. Bigger and louder is better. And uh, I had a robin that was nesting right at the fireworks. She, they, they left the nest. Just abandoned. It had eggs and everything in it. My question to you is, is uh, with the how it sounds like bombs going off, and uh, 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 is the loud commercial decibel level of a fireworks does it spook and run the birds off? And don't even have to mention about uh, our vets and PSD. Well. <laughs> Sometimes the fireworks almost make drive me off. I, I, I want to go to a mountaintop somewhere. It can be really loud, but, you know, p people do this. I think it probably does affect the birds and a lot of other things. Uh, I don't have, re once again, I don't have, you know, data to prove this. You know, we all, we, we've got to have data to prove what we're talking about or to show that this is an effect. Uh, I know there is a frog that's affected. It, Evidence indicates that it's affected by loud noises, uh, and I can't say a whole lot about it, but it's it's a frog called a crawfish frog, and apparently they get confused by loud noises. I I don't know. I ha the birds must go bananas when they hear uh, the stuff around the Fourth of July, but you, we can't tell people not to do that. I don't think. Uh, I think the thing to do is to convince. People that birds are nice too, that they are an asset to have around, the birds and the other wildlife. It's an asset. It's great to have these things around, and we should do everything possible to accommodate them. That's, that's my philosophy. 
but we're not going to stamp out fireworks today <laughs> or next week or next year. Uh, and, but I think you're onto something there, David. I, th- I think you are right about it. All right, uh, David, thanks for calling in this morning. Let's uh, stay on the phone lines. Next, we're off to Magnolia. John is on the line. It's your turn on the air, John. Go ahead. Yes, sir. How you doing there? Good. What do you have for us today? Well, uh, I got kind of like a, a worry question and an exciting, uh, you know, uh, quote. Um, the thing about the exciting part is uh, watching the birds, the hummingbirds, that thing actually has reverse. <laughs> yes. I mean, yes. he just stopped like a he just stopped like a Harrier jet. Yes, you know, air, just sit there. You're and a good he, observer. He yeah, and, but the scary part about hummingbirds is what the guy said earlier about sometime around the feeder it it, it, it will be seven or eight but eight of those things flying around zoom 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 and they got these little beaks and you you ever seen that little thing that thing is. It's like a big needle from a doctor, a big needle, you know. Yeah. And you'd be like, you'd be like, is it dangerous around these things? Cause they're so fast, like a bumblebee. I mean, he might boom and then accidentally run into your eye or something with that thing. You know, I don't know. Is is it dangerous around those cedars or not? I think not. But uh, I had a a relative once who was afraid that she was going to get pecked in the eye by a hummingbird. I, I don't think it's going to happen. They are very you know, nimble and quick on the wing. And you're right, they could go into river. They can fly fro- forwards and backwards and up and down in every direction. I really don't think there's much danger from them you know, poking you in the eye. I, but accidents happen. I mean, we have to... Uh, you know, talk to the lawyers about that. <laughs> it, I, but I don't, I don't, I don't think it's a problem. Uh, but it's, it's interesting. You've been observing them, and you've noticed uh, uh, that they fly in reverse. They can fly in reverse for sure. If you have too many at one feeder, put up another feeder some distance away. All right, uh, John. Thanks for calling in. You know, I like kind of seeing uh, some friends of mine out in California have several feeders up, and it's fun to just watch the the flittering and the going here and there and sort of it almost looks like they can sometimes defend their the uh, feeder that they like or whatever there's a lot of interplay that's going on fascinating to watch uh, you almost tired out just from watching them they're so energetic that's right and the and the hummingbirds you were watching in california are different species in fact they have several species they have annas and allens and i don't know what you were seeing if you were near the desert they might you might see the uh, costas hummingbird but yeah. anyway black chin hummingbirds but uh, yeah, it's, they're fun to watch, and I don't. Yeah, think we've got Anna's this morning. We've got Anna's hummingbird, and we sometimes have Rufus here. Yeah, you're up in the northwest. You could get Rufus. That's a, and that's one that sometimes shows up in Mississippi in the winter. Uh, those yes, those wintertime hummingbirds are usually a Rufus hummingbird. All right, uh, let's uh, move on to the phone lines. Next, we're going to get a caller from Mobile, and it is Lewis. Good morning, Lewis. Go ahead. Hi. Good morning. I was listening uh, to you comments about the painted buntings i don't think i've ever seen one personally um i don't know if they are prevalent here in mobile how would i attract them uh, what is it is there a certain type of bird seed to use to attract painted buntings they will come to uh millet the the i think it's called white proso millet it's the same thing that indigo buntings would eat do you see indigo buntings in your yard or at your feeders uh and, and this would be mainly in the spring when they when they first come through uh it's a small white it's, a, it's smaller than a bb these little seeds and that's what that's what the ones that came to my feeder ate. they are known to come to feeders and you're in you say you live in mobile or the mobile area yes. you what mobile yeah, you. They may not come to your house, but I bet you you could find them on around Dolphin Island or somewhere in that area. Uh, you're in a good location to find painted buntings, I, I think. And try a feeder that would attract, uh, as I said, indigo buntings, or uh, I'm trying to think what else eats the the pro. In the winter time, the the white proso millet is really good for white throated sparrows and and our you know, our native sparrows. Uh, does that does that help you? Uh, yes. Yeah, and I've seen them several times on Dolphin Island. So that would, if you want to travel a little ways from home, you can go down there. Right, and uh, I, I would think that he is situated in a good geographic location to see painted bunnings. 
Yeah. All right, Lewis. That's uh, great. I'll definitely try that. All right. Good to hear from you today, Lewis. Kevin Farrell here on MPB Think Radio's Creature Comforts with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, Libby Hartfield, and our guest for the hour, biologist Joe McGee. If you missed any of today's show, you can subscribe to the podcast using any podcasting app, or better still, download the MPB Public Media app. That way you have access to all the local MPB Think Radio programs on your schedule. So, Joe, before we jump into some conversation about uh, chimney swifts, you wanted to finish up our discussion on the painted bunting. Yeah, just a footnote. When I, first of all, they're very uncommon. Where I'm not in a good geographic location to see them, it's just they just don't occur over in East Mississippi. Uh, but when the one showed up in my yard, I, you know, I couldn't believe my eyes at first. I, I grabbed binoculars, and sure enough, there's a painted bunny, and it was feeding on native grass seed that had come up. I'm not, not one to mow every minute, <laughs> uh, and I don't, I don't even possess a weed eater. And so I hung f- a feeder with the prozo millet seed near where I'd seen it. And you know, birds, food means a lot to birds or to all wildlife. And it managed to, fi- to find that feeder, and for two or three days it came. This was before the uh, digital cameras. I, I, you know, I didn't get a photograph of it, but I hope that will re- repeat itself someday, and I can get a photograph of one. But l- let some native grasses grow up in your yard if possible. And then uh, maybe they'll come to your feeder. You'll get a good look at one. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit now about uh, chimney swift. If you would, tell us what these birds look like. Yeah, well, th- I got to thinking about chimney swifts because of a posting on Miss Bird, which is a listserv uh, online. I, I Probably a lot of the listeners know about it. And Gene Knight, a birder up at, he lives at Oxford, just reported on Miss Bird that once again, chimney swifts were being seen uh, entering a, uh, a large pipe at, on the campus of Ole Miss. There's a certain, it's known that they come there and they roost. It's, this happens at dusk. The birds just funnel in and spend the night inside this, um, this pipe. I've not actually seen it, but I have seen them do the same thing at the Strawberry Plains Audubon Center. They have chimney swift towers, these towers constructed for chimney swifts. It's really an interesting thing to see. And also, when I was growing up, the school that I attended, it's been torn down. I had a tall chimney. The, the school was heated by steam heat. We had radiators in all the classrooms. That meant there's a, a furnace somewhere burning coal to generate the steam. It had a tall chimney. And this time of year on overcast days and on into September, you could see hundreds, possibly thousands mm-hmm. of chimney swifts circling that that chimney at dusk on, on overcast days. They probably did it on non-overcast days, but we, we weren't at school, you know, by the time it happened. It happens late in the day or earlier in the day if it's overcast. So I got to thinking about chimney swifts. They used to nest in my chimney, the chimney of the house where I live, and I have not seen chimney swifts there in 20 years. Hmm. I don't know, and I don't know what, there are chimney swifts around. I don't know why they're not using my chimney anymore, but I really enjoyed having them. I looked forward to seeing the ch- and hearing the chimney swifts as much as, uh, folks do Purple Martins. You know, they arrive, uh, they start showing up in Mississippi probably in March, by the time the hummingbirds start uh, appearing. And uh, f- they're really pouring through in April. And some by late April, early May, a pair would have taken up in my <coughs> chimney. And uh, I always welcome that. And I, I can't explain what's ha- what happened because chimney swifts are not habitat specialists. They just need open sky. They need one square foot of of uh, real estate, if you will, to nest in. Otherwise, they're up in the air. They, uh, they occur in large numbers over urban areas. Like I, I used to see them in Meridian, mm-hmm. flying over the city. I haven't been there recently to see if they're still circling around uh, and over or forest. Uh, they're not habitat specialists, so I don't I don't know why they stopped nesting in my in my chimney. So, do they get around maybe differently than other kind of birds do? Yeah, chimney swifts are interesting. They're about the size of a barn swallow. I, probably most of our listeners are familiar with chimney swifts. They're easy to see. They're up in the, you know they're up in the air, although they appear black, uh, you know, in the sky. When you, I actually held one in my hand one time, I'll have to tell you how that happened to be. They're really a, uh, a dark charcoal gray color, with uh, a white throat and there's white around the face. Quite a few years ago, I heard a strange sound one night, a a sound like I'd never heard, but it sounded like a bird in distress, and in fact, it was a bird in distress. It was a chimney swift that had been caught by a cat. This happened. I I never dreamed a cat could even catch, find a chimney swift, but I was able to get the chimney swift away from the cat, and it appeared to be uninjured. 
And I put it in, this was at night, I put it in a box in a quiet room and left it overnight, just didn't bother, just left it alone. And the next morning, I go get the, and I didn't, I thought the bird maybe did, I don't know. But I opened the box carefully, and I could tell it was not dead, it, was, it seemed to be okay. And I carefully picked it up and took it outside and was holding it in my left hand, I remember, and I uncurled my fingers, and it stayed in the palm of my hand for maybe two seconds and then took off. <laughs> like the proverbial, you know, bat out of hell. <laughs> and, I mean, they're amazing flowers. They're called swifts because they are swift. And I thought it was going to hit a tree. I thought it may be disoriented. It almost flew into a big old sycamore tree. But no, at the last second, it veered to the left, and <laughs> I never saw it again. But that's how I know what they look like. Uh, it, it's really a pretty bird. Uh, Roger Torrey Peterson says they look like a cigar with wings. It's, <laughs> it's all, They seem to... They apparently don't. Ha- they seem to not have a neck. They've got a neck, but you just don't see it. It's all you know. They're very like a bullet with wings, and the wingspan is about twelve inches. I think I've I've, I've read. When the wings are folded, they f- fold beyond the tail. But here's the interesting thing about chimney swifts: they can't perch. You will never ever see a chimney swift perched on a utility line. Hmm. They can't. They cannot perch. Uh, they can't walk, but they cling to the side of rough surfaces, and that's why uh, chimneys are so, so appealing to them, because uh, they go down in there and uh, can cling to the sides and you know construct their nest and and so forth inside the chimney. So you rarely get a close up. I was lucky to find you know, to be able to see one up close like that. So my suggestion is if they discover a new type of swift to name it a Taylor Swift. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> okay, uh, let's move on quickly from that <laughs> from that pun. <laughs> We've got uh, Elizabeth on the line from Oxford. Looks like a question for Dr. Major. Elizabeth, you're on the air with us. Go ahead, please. Good morning. My question for Dr. Majors is about honey. Someone suggested for my family's dog for allergies and itching and chewing on their feet that a little bit of native honey was a good uh, would, would be a good help. Any thoughts on that, Dr. Majors? I'm not sure about research or science about that. However, I know that in people it is recommended uh, to have maybe a little honey once a day, uh, native honey, and I see no reason that it would hurt uh, the dogs certainly you can give a small amount and see what kind of results you can get and maybe report back to us. Okay. So we will I, w- try. I would try it. I would try it. Thank, yes. thank you so much. Y'all have a great You're day. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth, for your call. So, Joe, the other show, uh, the other bird that you wanted to talk about this morning was the yellow warbler. And I'm wondering about the name of this do, warbler. Does that have anything to do with their call? Like, you know, a warbling. It, yeah, war, there's a group of birds, sometimes uh, uh, informally referred to as wood warblers uh, that occur in North America. They're very colorful birds. Most of them have some yellow on them, and it is because they warble. But to tell you, their songs are considered a warble. But to tell you the truth, my idea of a warble is more like the song of an eastern bluebird, a sweet, you know, sweet musical notes. Warblers often sound a bit like insects. Uh, there, there's a, two or three that that's, that that. It's truly a warble, but the uh, yellow warbler has a distinctive song. It's easy to remember. Yellow warblers are, uh, as the name suggests, they're mostly yellow. They have more yellow, perhaps, than any of our warblers, although a prothonotary warbler has almost as much, and uh, a Kentucky warbler, say, is almost as yellow as a yellow warbler. But the males are bright yellow, uh, have chestnut streaking on the on their breast. Really a pretty bird. Now, th- unlike the chimney swifts, though, they don't nest in Mississippi. They are, they're just a transit. They move through in sp- during spring migration and in fall migration. And I used to always look forward to the—I'd to the. To the uh, I'd hear them first. I'd, I'd wake up one morning, and I would hear a yellow warbler singing. I'd say, aha, they're moving through. And sure enough, I could go out and find it. They're easy to see. It, as warblers go, they're pretty large. They're about the size of a prothonotary warbler or a— yellow rumped warbler, which is a common warbler here in the wintertime. So it's not one of the real tiny, chickadee-sized warblers. So easy to hear the males, easy to see. And they would come through in some numbers. It was just, it was just always a pleasant thing to, to, you know, to experience. And you'd see, I would see a good many. I, you know, I, I'd have to go back to my notes and see how many I, I, I was actually seeing. You'd see two or three maybe at a time. Some days they've all, you know, moved. You don't see any. They've already already moved through, but mid-April to mid-May, I would see yellow warblers, and then I'd see maybe one or two more in late May, and then one or two in June. Even now, I guess that's 
you know, a straggler, a latecomer, none in July. I, I've never seen a yellow warbler in Mississippi in July. But then in August, uh, I'd start seeing them again. And this, the reason I thought about yellow warblers for this program, somebody on Miss Bird posted a photograph of one. They had seen one in their yard up at Sidon. Uh, and they photographed it, and they were a little surprised that they saw a yellow warbler in August. But it can happen. You'll see one or two, and I know I was seeing them because they would— I have a bird bath with a dripper. I, at, at that time, my dripper was actually a water hose dri- hanging over a, a limb of a tree, and I would turn the water real low so it just dripped into the bird bath. And weather like we've been having, even now that it's a little bit cooler, they need water. Over my way, I mean, there's no water available, and they will really come to the— to the bird bath. I had a common yellow throat at my feet, uh, bird bath yesterday, but not a yellow warbler. And I don't know what's getting, I don't know why it is that their numbers seem to be down. I haven't seen a yellow warbler in 20 years. Hmm. Uh, and I don't know why it may have something to do with, you know, loss of habitat. It may have something to do with cowbirds. Cowbirds are an edge species and they're a, what's known as a brood parasite. They lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. And yellow warblers are one of the birds they choose. And when this happens, the yellow warblers, they detect this egg that that it's not their own. They see it and they know it's not their own. But what they do is then build another nest on top of that nest. They, they, they think, you know, they're, they, I, you know, think in quotation marks that okay, we're not going to incubate this egg. <laughs> and so, and they may have one of their eggs or two already there. And so they waste a lot of energy now. They're building another nest on top of the first nest, and starting. In the meantime, time moves on. You know, they've got just a limited time in North America before they need to head back south. And they may do this two or three times. There are cases where four yellow warbler nests have been found st- stacked mm. up on top of each other. A waste of you know time and energy for the yellow warblers. And so uh, if this happens enough from cowbirds, I could see how that might impact their numbers. But I, I, you know, I'm not saying this is what the reason is. I don't know for sure. We need to take another break. But before we do, let's get one call in. And we're going off to Hernando. Don has a comment for us. Go ahead, Don. You're on the air. Good morning. How are y'all doing this morning? Good. Good, good. Enjoy y'all's show, everything about it. And uh, one of the things I got from your show was uh, a recommendation on a bird app that identifies bird calls. And I think it was called uh, Merlin uh, through the Cornell Lab. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yes. And uh, first I pulled it up and... uh, because I live in a rural area, rural DeSoto County, and uh, there are so many birds in the woods that I never can even see that I hear them, but I can't identify them because I can't see them. And, but as soon as I got that uh, app put on my phone and turned it on, it started pulling up names, and it was just it was amazing and and so accurate on the birds, you know, because I would eventually see the bird. And, and licking my uh, bird guide, and sure enough, that was exactly what, what I was hearing. And so it'll pull up just one bird after another as I'm listening to it. Some birds I don't really even hear, but it'll but the uh, uh, phone picks up all the different sounds and will uh, start picking up the, the bird calls and identify them. It'll have I'll have six or eight six or eight birds at a time. Uh, you know, being identified. So I just want to thank you all for turning me on to that. I've I've become a full-time bird listener now. (laughs) That's good. It it is. Isn't it fun? It's just incredible. I will warn you, they say that it can be as much as 10% um, mistake. So that would be one in 10 birds that might tell you wrong. But what I've always said is that it tells you what to look for, you know, what to what to figure out might be there. And I do think that in some habitats, it's probably more accurate because it is, to me, it's the best of AI, I guess. And it depends on how many people contribute to it to, um, it gets better and better in an area. So if you're in an area where there are a lot of bird watchers and a lot of people using it, it may be much more accurate. Yeah, it's a big help, I'm sure. And with as as the listener said, he listens to. I mean, he looks. At, he then looks in the field guide, and so with a little more research, you can probably get really close to 100% correct using that using that Merlin. 
All right, Don, thanks for the call and that observation and recommendation. If anyone else is listening, you might want to give the Merlin app a try to help you identify bird calls. So, John, I'm curious, as we talked about the brown-headed cowbird and sort of how, in my mind, sort of cheats and tries to get away with some shenanigans there. Are there other examples of that in the bird world or even the wildlife in, in general that sort of kind of game other birds or species or whatever? <laughs> Yes. Uh, some ducks are known to do that. It's known as, I think it's called dumping. <laughs> uh, some of the n- ducks that nest in uh, nest boxes, the cavity nesting ducks, uh, you can check the nest and it'll have way more eggs than that one that one female could ever have laid. And I don't know why they do that. But the brown-headed cowbird is an interesting, it's a native species and it's kind of interesting. There is, there is actually a, a couple of other cowbirds that have recently showed up in Mississippi. One's called a bronze cowbird. It occurs, originally occurred out in the southwest and in Mexico, but there it's documented now annually on the coast, and another one called a shiny cowbird. And they're all brood parasites, and it's thought that the brown-headed cowbirds got this habit because they followed the bison, the herds of bison around, and the bison were always on the move. And they're feeding on uh, insects that the bison stir up and also seeds of the grasses and so forth. Well, they didn't have time to stop and build a nest and, <laughs> and lay eggs and incubate the eggs. And, you know, like the chimney swifts take five or six weeks to accomplish what they, what they do. So they thought, aha, we'll just lay an egg in another bird's nest and move on. <laughs> and a female brown-headed cowbird, if she laid them all in one nest, it's my understanding it would be a large number of eggs. So they're, they can really deposit eggs in a whole bunch of bird nests. And they do so in many of our native bird species. And you might say, well, what's the problem if, you know, they're, they're always here, but they probably were not here in the numbers that we have them now. We've got so much edge habitat. Now, it's an edge bird. They don't go way into the interior of a woodland. It's not a woodland bird, but they'll go about a half a mile inside. Well, you get about half a mile into a woodland today and you go out the other side. It's just a half, <laughs> you know, they don't have far to go to get to the other side. So that's that can be a problem. But. Uh, yeah, in Europe, the cuckoos, they, they have a, you know, a cuckoo that does that. I'm not sure we have a cuckoo, a native cuckoo in Mississippi that breeds in, in the state. The, uh, in fact, Libby had them in her yard earlier this year. They posted photographs on oh, Miss Bird, I believe, the yellow-billed <laughs> cuckoo. Yes. And, and I'm not do you I'm not sure it ever, that it's a brood parasite. I, I, Actually, they can be brood parasites because I wondered since uh, – and during cicada years, particularly, and uh, but they, their first choice when they, this is kind of strange, but their first choice when they have uh, too many eggs that they can't tend is they find another yellow billed cuckoo nest to lay them in. <laughs> well, that's which pretty good. Kind of to <laughs> that's defeat neat. the purpose. Yeah, okay. But they will lay in some other birds' nests too. They are neat birds. I yeah. found cuckoo nests when their eggs are kind of large, and I understand the egg, the chicks ha- uh, fledge pretty quickly. Uh, but I yeah, over- ours were amazing. It's it, they, they really looked like little dinosaurs. Right. And we could get up fairly close to them. They were right at eye level. Uh huh. And uh, they 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 hatched very quick and were out of there. Yeah, yeah. They they were in my yard this summer, but I I was never able to find the nest. If you saw my yard, you wouldn't see why. <laughs> yeah. So got about thirty seconds left. Do most of the birds that they they get their nest bar do uh, sort of ignore them like the yellow warbler does? Well, the American robins recognize the cowbird uh, egg and, and toss it out. <laughs> so it, it depends on the species, but it, but some don't and just raise the bird. Those uh, are the good birds of the bird world. <laughs> I'll adopt anything in my nest. That's it. <laughs> All right, that is going to wrap us up for today. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio with funding provided in part by listeners. To hear today's show or a previous show, you can visit creaturecomforts.mpbonline.org. Our show is produced by Abram Nanny. So for Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest Joe McGee, I'm Kevin Farrell. Inviting you to stay tuned because up next at 10, it's AutoCorrect. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for another Creature Comforts. It's heard only on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.